All right, good morning, everyone. And thank you, Lady Dai, for that prayer on my behalf. Really need it. So thank you very much. And for those of you who've been here, she was praying for you as well. So welcome you. I'm glad you are here with us, those who are here. And makes an special welcome to anyone who might be watching by the internet, be it on Zoom or on Facebook. It's just that um, you're hearing what is being said and not just seeing what you are seeing. But we're very glad you could join us and trust that your time with us will be well spent. I think the first time I ever saw one, I was back in the United States. It was some time ago, but it was very popular at the time. And I've been popular since. And it's very likely that you have seen one as well. I'm talking about that little bumper sticker that the image that says, God is my co-pilot. God is my co-pilot. Very popular at one time, almost as popular as the other one that said, WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? And if you're like me, you might have seen it. If you have driven in Jamaica or basically any street, chances are you've seen it. Is, or God is my co-pilot. Since then, I've seen images that say similar, say or similar, Jesus is my co-pilot. And if you're like me, then you probably thought that mm, that sounds great. So that that person really has not act together or her act together. That all their spiritual dogs are lined up, that they have God with them. But the more you think about it, you understand that there is not as religious or as authentic as it may seem. Because what is that really saying? What it's saying is if God is your co-pilot, then he's not the pilot. That means he's not the one who is determining your destination. He's not the one who is uh, determining the flight speed or the flight path or the altitude. You are the one that is doing that. That means God, when all is done, on, is just there as a backup. He's just there to help you with your planning. He is nothing more than just a co pilot. Now, am I saying this? Why am I speaking about this? Why am I even talking about co pilot today? What does that do with the sermon? Well, today is the last day in the Christian worship calendar. As you know, we subscribe to the Christian worship calendar and our lectionary is based on that. And today is the 52nd Sunday in the year. We begin a new cycle, C cycle, not three year cycle, next week, Sunday, God willing. But today is the last day in the Christian worship calendar. And the calendar that forces us almost, you could say, to look at the life of Jesus Christ because we are a Christ based, Christ centered, Christ focused group, denomination. We keep Christ at the center of the center. So we want to keep focus on him year throughout the year. So during the year, our calendar that we preach from helps us to um, focus on his birth, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And over the past few weeks, you know, we're looking at his role as our present high priest. And we know that he's preparing now to come back as king of kings and lord of lords. So it should not surprise me to find out that today, the last day on the Christian worship calendar is referred to as Christ the King Day. It's the day we recognize Jesus Christ as King, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And so the message today will have something to do about the kingship of Jesus Christ. The title of the message is, uh, Is Jesus Your Co-Pilot? And the text is based on John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Before I turn there, let us just pause for another moment of prayer. Let's go ahead, please. Father in heaven, almighty God, we thank you so much for us allowing us to be here. We thank you, Son of God, for the many blessings that you do give us. So one of the blessings you have here in Jamaica is the opportunity of being able to meet Whenever we want to turn God and to worship him, we have freedom of assembly, we have freedom of worship. Help us to God not to take these things for granted. I really make the most of the opportunity we have to come together, not for safety in the assembly of ourselves, 
together, you encourage us in the word, but to really come together in times like this to encourage each other and be encouraged by each other. Father, we begin this message with uh, for your guidance and your help. As a part of the church, uh, we pray for inspiration, we pray for your guidance and your direction. We pray that what needs to be heard be what we say. And we need that what is said will be a benefit and a blessing to those who hear. So speak to us, Father God. We ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. John chapter 18, verses 33 to 37. Read as follows. Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But no, my kingdom is from another place. You're a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you're right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this reason I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What you're seeing here is a part of the trial of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is on trial just before he's executed. But to understand what is happening here, that we go to get a little bit of the context to understand what brought us to this point. And this, of course, is in John chapter 18. So if you read some of the earlier chapters in John, and indeed the other, it's not the other gospel, it's not the gospel to include Matthew, Mark, and Luke you realize that ever since his birth, Jesus has been a threat to the status quo. When the three magi came and told Herod that a king is born, and, you know, where is the star, where is the king? He became threatened and he, as a result, as you know, killed every child two years and on, is my understanding. So he was a threat to the status quo. He criticized the Pharisees, he criticized the scribes, the Sadducees didn't like him because they saw another threat. He was talking about his kingdom and, and, and kingship. And they always were afraid that if he sent the wrong message to the Romans, they would somehow um, have reason to come and invade and the oppressing him further. So they, were, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to kill him because he was like their conscience. But they didn't have the right to kill him. They could not kill him. If you look at what we see here in in John chapter 19, the next chapter, in verse seven, it says this, we have a law and according to that law, John chapter 19, verse seven, we have a law and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and he went back inside the palace where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus said, gave him no answer. Will you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, you have no power over me if you're not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. But the Jews kept shouting, if you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, right, what did he hear? The threat. Because they were saying with you that threat, you know, that if you set this man free, you are no friend of Caesar. And we see why that's important. Isn't it? When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat. At the place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was a preparation of the passage about the sixth hour. And it goes on. What I see here is uh, what we read in verse seven. It says, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. What they want to kill him for, the Jews want to kill Jesus Christ for, is because 
he claimed to be the son of God. And again, more evidence that speaks to the deity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ was very God. That was something he claimed. He did not deny it at the right time. But they could not kill him because of blasphemy. They did not have the power of life and death. And so what they had to do is they had to try to manipulate Caesar to get Caesar to do their bidding, to do their killing for them. But they couldn't tell Caesar that his crime was blasphemy because Caesar would not kill him for that. They had to get Caesar to believe that this one was a threat to the kingship and alternative king. And so they tried to get him to understand that this man is guilty of sedition. He has been talking about being a king and it's very possible that he could want to overthrow your empire. And so that would give Caesar the grounds now, not Caesar, Pilate, sorry, the grounds to kill him because he's not be killing him for blasphemy as the Jews wanted. We killed him for sedition. But the purpose of the Jews would have been satisfied. And as long as he's killed, they don't matter how he's killed or why he's killed, just that he is killed. And so they are manipulating Pilate to do this. And so we come to a text, right? Before the sentence is, is passed, and we see Pilate asking Jesus Christ in verse uh, 34, 33, are you the king of the Jews? Now, at, at this point, he's not really concerned much about who Jesus is. He has heard about Jesus and he has about what he did. But his concern is more as to whether this man is a threat to the empire. Do we need to be concerned? Do we need to be worried about this man, about what this man is doing? Is it possible that he may be stirring up some group of people to overthrow the administration or whatever. So what do you think is this kind of a threat assessment, if you will, of this man's role and status and position in the society? So Jesus' response, is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or others talk, or did others talk to you about me? Now that's interesting because usually the way these interviews are connected, the governor is the one who asks questions. And the offender or the uh, person, the respondent, is the one who sits and listens meekly to what is being said. But here it is, Christ is kind of taking control of the city, really showing that he is not out of control, that even though he is the one supposed to be on trial, he's going to put Pilate on trial. So he asks Pilate, about Pilate's motive. Why are you even asking me about whether I'm a king? Don't you know? Is it something that you have heard or asking, are you asking this out of personal interest? Is it something that you want to know genuinely or are you just being used? Are you just being played by these Jews? Are you trying to do their bidding, right? So he's taking control of me, not in a forceful, rude, in, you know, arrogant way, but just to you know that as he says in another passage, no one takes my life from me. I lay down my life. In other words, it's not that you are going to kill me, it's that I'm offering my life, right? So he goes on and, and he responds, he's taking charge. He's showing that even though this is my trial, I am still in control, right? So, so Pilate answers, am I a Jew? Pilate replied, it was your people and your chief priest who handed you over to me. What is it? You have done. I mean, it is not ordinary for somebody to give up their own person like this, unless the person has really done something really terrible. I remind you of what we read elsewhere in John, in John chapter one, um, John chapter one, verse ten. It says, "He, some of Jesus Christ, was in the world, and the world was in the world, and though the world was made through him." The world did not recognize him. And by the world here, it just mean the known world. They basically look for all intended purposes, the Roman Empire. The people did not recognize him. He came to that which is his own, but his own did not receive him. His own did not receive him. They did not receive him as king, as Christ, as the Messiah, as Lord, 
and they're the ones now who are turning him over. So when Pilate says, uh, it was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. He just, again, bearing testament to the fact that Jesus Christ was indeed rejected by his own people. Jesus, verse 36, Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But no, my kingdom is from another place. Don't you read this when Christ is here saying, my kingdom is not of this world. He's not talking about location of the kingdom, right? He's talking about the source of the kingdom, the origin. Where did this kingdom? So it's not, it's not I'm saying, it's not just Jesus Christ is saying, my kingdom is not from Samaria. My kingdom is not from Judea. My kingdom is not even from this Roman Empire. My kingdom is from outside of the Roman Empire. My kingdom is in Jamaica. He's not saying that. He's not talking about the location of the kingdom. What he's talking about is the source, the origin. And what he's trying to show them uh, and show us by extension is that this kingdom is really the kingdom of God. It has its origins in heaven. It's the kingdom of heaven. It's the kingdom of God. It's God's kingdom. It's not man's kingdom. And it doesn't operate the way earthly kingdoms operate because it's a heavenly kingdom. It's a kingdom of God. He says, if it were like any other kingdom, then my servants would fight to prevent my arrest. But as you can see, that is not happening, which again is just proof that my kingdom is not like any other kingdom. But once he hears the word kingdom, then his ears, I thought of Pilate, his ears perk up because that's what he's worried about. He's worried about, well, does this man have a kingdom where it may be there? Right? That is going to be a threat to us or to me. I need to understand who this man was, this man called Pilate. Pilate was a governor who had jurisdiction over Judea and Samaria, as I understand it. And how did this come about? This came about because, if you remember, when Jesus Christ was born, Herod the Great was in power at the time. And even though he was called king by some, he was really a vassal king, you could say. He was really like a, um, a puppet king because he ruled at the behest of Caesar and Romans, right? So. He was there and he had some autonomy, yes. Um, but then he died. And so his kingdom, quote unquote kingdom, was divided among his three sons, Antipas, Philip, and Archelaus. Archelaus, right? The youngest one, Archelaus, was given Judea and Samaria to rule over. But when Archelaus was made king, or tetrarch, or whatever you call it, right? He was 18 years old and he was very flight to flight and I guess very mature and didn't really rule as a good king. And his very own people appeal to Caesar or to some power that be above him to ask them to remove him. And so he was removed from that position and Pilate was installed. I don't know if Pilate was the first one, but Pilate could have been a succession of a person who replaced Archelaus. And so he's there, not as an elected official, not, not even as a popular official, but as a, a kind of a political appointee, right? So he has to be careful about how he manages the affairs, all right? So he is that concerned about his standing and how Caesar would do him because he doesn't want to lose a little job. He wants to stay as governor, all right? So when he hears the word kingdom now, Christ talking about my kingdom is not of this world, is your perks up. So he says in verse 37, you're a king there. Just answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And it's not in our text for today, but it's, it's in the next verse where it says, Pilate responding, well, what is true? What is true? Almost like one of these, no idea is first, of course, one of the truth is relative. Your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, right? But the truth, of course, is that he, Christ, came to earth to qualify, 
to be king of kings and lord of lords. And he has done that. And it's either you recognize him as king or you don't recognize him as king. So that is kind of where we are. Jesus Christ is on trial for his life because the Jews want him killed. They want him killed because as far as they are concerned, he's guilty of blasphemy, of claiming to be God as God is God when they have only one God. But they can't kill him. So they want the Romans to kill him, to do their dirty work. And so they're trying to get Caesar now, not Caesar, Pilate, to see him as some sort of individual who has aspirations to become king, who has claimed to be king. And so if the, in the eyes of Romans, deserving of death or prison, he's like you not know, a threat to the local status quo. He's a threat to Caesar because he's in a, in a situation where there is no other king. Caesar is the king. Um, if, you, if you go back, if you go on to verse chapter 19, next verse, after um, Paul decides to crucify him, right, and sentence him, uh, verse 50, he says in Latin part of verse 14, here's your king, Pilate said to the Jews, but they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king, Pilate asked? And this is what they say, we have no king but Caesar. The chief priests answered. I not any other Jew saying that the chief priests are saying that we have no king but Caesar. This is something that on a good day and a normal day, no Jew, no self-respecting Jew would have said. As a matter of fact, even though Jews became Christians later on, one of the big problems why they became so persecuted by the Roman state is because even though the state didn't mind other religions, operating, as long as your religion allow you to recognize Caesar as God, even if as another God, that was fine. But the Christians could not bring themselves to do that, right? And that's why they became outstanding. That's why they attracted attention because they would not bow down. And so to hear, the, not just an average Jew, but the chief priests saying to Pilate that we have no king but Caesar, is John must have dropped the door because it was totally unexpected, totally out of time. It shows how desperate they were and how badly they wanted Christ out of the name. How badly they wanted Christ to be killed. So that, in a sense, is the essence. But, but notice and understand that at no point does Jesus seem to be afraid. At no point does he seem to be out of control. He's always in control. Things are going according to script, even if not as the disciples would want. Everything is happening according to God's plan of salvation of mankind. Right? So what can we take away from this passage? What can we take away um, from this text? There's so much we could take away, but three things I want us to think about as we prepare to wind up. And they have to do with the three statements by Jesus Christ. One of which was a question and two of which were simple statements. The first one is in verse 34, where after Pilate has asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Christ says to him, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? Bridget, what I want us to do here at this point is forget for a moment that Jesus Christ is talking to Pilate and wonder what you would respond as if he were talking to you. So think of Jesus Christ and ask you this. Is that your own idea or did others talk to you about me? How can you apply that to yourself? But think about this. What is your relationship with Jesus Christ like? How do you see your relationship with Jesus Christ? And what is your relationship with Jesus Christ based upon? Is it a relationship that is based upon personal experience? Your own interaction with Jesus Christ? Praying to him? Listening to him more as you read the Bible? Or is your relationship based only on what other people have said? Is your relationship with Jesus Christ based on other people's testimony 
or do you have a testimony of your own, right? He asked Pilate, is that your own idea? The question you are asking that coming from you, from your heart, or did others talk to you about me? For those of us who are Christian, the question is simple. Do you know Christ for yourself? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your, not my wife, not my husband, not my brother, my, not my pastor, but as your very own, as my very own Lord and Master, right? So that's the first thing. Is your relationship based on your own personal experience with Christ or on what others have said about Jesus Christ? The second point I want to take away has to do with the second statement by Jesus Christ, where he says, uh, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jews. But no, my kingdom is from another place. The point he's trying to get across is very clear. Very, very clear. The first part, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. And the last part of it, he says, my kingdom is from another place. No matter how you cut it, what he's saying basically, my kingdom is not like any kingdom around here. It's not like any kingdom that you never custom with. But more importantly, brethren, his kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It is not an earthly kingdom. And it is one that we should be mindful of. And we need to understand that the question you could ask that is, uh, as Christians, uh, where is your allegiance? Where is your idea? Which kingdom are you really concerned about? You know, we, we live in a world where um, we're in a fight for scarce benefits and spoils, as one prime minister said, where our livelihoods are dependent in, in a lot of cases on which party is in power, especially if you live in one of those garrison constituencies where your allegiance or your, your well-being, let us say, your well-being depends on whether or not your party is in power. When your party is in power, you do well. When your party is out of power, dog damn, you suffer, you suffer. You suffer, so, as they say, through wooden spoon. <laughs> right? That's just the way it is. And because of that, people can get so caught up in the politics. Because as if your life depends on it, your life do depend on it, or your life you And so it's very easy sometimes so start to favor one party over another and actually promote one party over another and even pray for one party over another. And it's not just here in Jamaica with the Jamaica Labour Party and the People's National Party. It's all the United States what's happening now with the Republicans and Democrats to the point where even Christians are concerned very concerned about the politics. I guess, in a sense, that's rightly so. But so when Marsh you're agitating and lobbying, and as one, one commentator, one, one pastor was saying, as we were talking about this very passage here, says after the election, and people are saying, Sir, you need to comment, you need to come in this person. So, so all I say is this When I went to bed last night, Jesus Christ was Lord. And when I woke up this morning, Jesus Christ was still. <laughs> As Christian brothers, that's what we really need to know, right? We don't need, yes, we need to be concerned and we can pray, you know, but at the end of the day, when all is said and done, Jesus Christ is still Lord, right? And God is still in control. We believe that. Other people might lose faith, they might lose hope because things around them are falling down. But even when things around us are falling down, we know who we serve, right? We know who we serve and we know who we are. Right? And we know that he has never left us, he will never leave us, and he will never forsake us. So that's the point, not the second point. The third point, as to what he says in verse 37b, right? In response to the question, you are a king, you know, the statement, some Bibles have it as a statement by Pilate, where Pilate says, you are a king. Or some Bibles have it as a, a question where he says, oh, so are you a king then? Are you a king then? But whatever way you interpret, whatever way your Bible says, the, the key is, 
is this. Jesus Christ said that Pilate said he was a king. He says, you are right in saying I am a king. I think other translation says you are right. Are you saying I am a king? Right? I want to think about that for a bit because there's something here that we should not miss. This, according to Jesus Christ, is what Pilate says. Pilate says to Jesus Christ, you are a king. He is recognizing him as a king. And the Christ response is, you say, I am a king. And you say, right, you. because for this reason I was born, for this reason I came to the world, etc., etc." et cetera. I want you to stick up in right there. I want to turn to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to come back to this. We're going to turn to Matthew chapter 16. And notice what we read there. In Matthew chapter 16. And we read in verse 13. Matthew 16. We're going to read in verse 13. Peter's confession of Christ. It's okay. Matthew 16 verse 13 begins. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples of who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? St. Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Why is that important? I think Christ, brethren, would want to know what you would say. Right? What you would say. What does he hear is that in the Matthew account, Jesus Christ asked Peter and those with him, who do you say? What about you? Who do you say that I am? He's concerned about what they say. And Peter says, you are the Christ. The Son of the living God. Right? Pilate who does Pilate say he is? Pilate says, uh, you are a king. So the question for us then, brethren, is what do we say? Do we recognize Jesus Christ as king? Do we recognize him as Christ? Do we recognize him as the son of the living God? And having recognized him as such, if we do, how do we relate to him? How do we relate to him? Do we allow him to rule our lives? And this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning. Is he the one that determines our destination? Is he the one that determines our flight path? Is he the one that determines the attitude at which we fly? Is he the determine our, that, that determines our likes and our dislikes, where we give, what to give attention to, where we go, or where we go, what we say or what we don't say? How involved is Jesus Christ in your life? Is Jesus Christ Lord of your life? Is Jesus Christ your king? Or is Jesus Christ just your Pope? I hope you would say that he is your king. So if you are a believer, if you already accepted Jesus Christ as your personal savior, and so because of that, because you believe because of God's grace, you have been transferred from death to life, then it's no time to move on, if you haven't done so already, from being just a mere believer to being a Christian or a Christ follower. Someone who is trying to follow Christ, someone who's trying to do what Christ says, someone who's trying to let Christ lead them, who has in effect given the reins over to Christ and has allowed Christ to become the pilot and not just who fight. If you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Master, or even as your Savior, we ask that you do so now. That you take that first step to not just hear what Jesus Christ has said, but to believe what Jesus Christ has said. That he came into this world to be your king. For that purpose was he born. And Bridget, we have had prime ministers and prime ministers and presidents and presidents and emperors, some good, some bad. But at the end of the day, most people decide there's no better person to rule over you 
than a good king. Someone who is all powerful, almighty, but who also rules in your interest. In Jesus Christ, we have such a new world. You know, I've tried to live without Christ. Before I was called, I think mean, since that part, I've tended sometimes to go back my way. And trust me, it just doesn't work. It does not work. You are much better off. You are much safer. Not trying to fly the plane for yourself. But allowing Jesus Christ to fly the plane on your behalf. Because if you are flying the plane, you can get distracted. You can go in off in some wrong direction. If Jesus Christ is flying the plane, then you know that you're on the right path all the time, every time. And so my appeal to you today would be to let us today on this Christ the King Day when we recognize and present Jesus Christ to the world as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Not yet ruling in its fullness, but the kingdom is already here. We in the church are a part of that kingdom. Let us, if we believe, accept Jesus Christ as our first receiver. Let us accept him as our Lord and Master, as the King of our lives, and let us act accordingly, recognizing Jesus as King and not just as co Father in heaven, Almighty God, we come to you now at the end of this lesson. Very thankful for your word, and very thankful for the understanding of the word that you've given to us. But today, eternal God, we are very mindful of the fact that you've reminded us that Jesus Christ is not the sole savior or creator or sustainer, but he is our king. He's the one that we bow down to. He's the one that deserves all worship, all honor, all praise because he is indeed worthy. We pray to our God that you help us to really not just recognize him as the king over our lives, but to deal with him, to relate to him in that way. Listening, Father, to what he says carefully, trying to discern what is it that he wants us to do, how he wants us to live, so that we can order our lives and live those kind of lives that will really be in harmony with your will for us, your desire for us, and according to your will. So Father, it's hard to help us to be humble, help us to be submissive, help us to be subservient to Jesus Christ, allow your spirit to guide us and to lead us as we seek to God to become not just believers, but Christ followers, accepting Jesus Christ as the king of our life and not just as a court or a co-pilot, as some have said. So we thank you again for your blessing. We thank you for sending your son. We thank you, Jesus Christ, that you are qualified, that you have earned the right to be a ruler or a rightful king. We ask, oh God, that you help us relate to you as such. This is the ask in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much.